Okay, so this is chapter one, A Daughter is Born. You'll be wanting to annotate the first line for gender roles. So when I was born, people in our village commiserated with my mother and nobody congratulated my father. So obviously this says a lot about the way they view gender in Pakistan. And then the last star blinked out is a little bit of a motif of stars, or probably just a symbol, it's not really used that often. Um, occasionally they refer to her as a, a glowing star or something like that as well. Uh, we Pashtuns see this as an auspicious sign. So that's Pashto culture. So again, gender roles, it's all about, she's kind of setting up the way that her, her life was a bit different to the way most other daughters being born are viewed, sort of how her life is going to be kind of different. Obviously the last star blinked out is kind of a little bit reminiscent of, of sort of something a little bit biblical, kind of like the, you know, the star when stars when Jesus was born or something like that. Um, my father Zia Dun is different from most Pashtu men, so she's characterizing her dad in a different way here. And she doesn't really use that much characterization of people. So when she does, you really want to make note of it. And she's mostly characterizing uh, Maniba, uh, Malka Enor, her mum or her dad. Like that's kind of all she ever really gets into any detail describing the personality of. And then we've got some love and support. So he says he looked into my eyes after I was born and fell in love. Then we've got language of Mal Malai of Maywand. And then, which is an allusion, not an intertextual reference. And then Pashtuns are a proud people of many tribes split between Pakistan and Afghanistan. We live as we have for centuries. So again, Pashtun culture. Uh, by a code called Pashtunwali, which is basically hospitality. And this is almost becomes a motif. She refers to it that often. Um, she's always talking about how the Americans or the Afghanis or the terrorists or whoever she's talking about often take advantage of their their sort of hospitality. Then we've got a little maxim or a quote, without honour, the word counts for nothing. And that's also language, so we'll put a little ABC there. And also the word maxim, or maybe just a quotation symbol. Obviously my hand's in the way. Then we've got a whole chunk of intertextual references where she's juxtaposing, or just contrasting, I guess makes sense as well between the culture of the East and the culture of the West. Uh, so you can read through that and kind of make sense of what that means, but that's the kind of annotation you're looking for. In Malai, we Pashtuns have our very own Joan of Arc. So again, intertextual reference, and she's making a link between herself and Joan of Arc. So she's sort of building up a fair bit of positive energy about herself, I guess. She's really talking herself up. Then we've just got foreshadowing. It's a sad name. It means grief stricken. And then top of the right hand page, my father used to sing me a song written by the famous poet Ramat Shah Sa'el of Peshawar. And then, so of course, this is all an intertextual reference and she's actually got the poem there. We've got a little bit of stuff about the Swat River, Swat Valley rather. And just keep in mind that this is the sort of the things that happen to the Swat Valley as sort of for her symbolic of all of Pakistan. And she's trying to make a comment on kind of, she's almost setting up her own exit, which as we should already know, she will later leave. So that's kind of, she's sort of building up her own little understanding and explanation of why she can't stay in Pakistan afterwards. Then we've got here West and East being contrasted. So people often call Swat the Switzerland of the East which you could also call a metaphor, similarly, if you want to do that, and is a heavenly kingdom of mountains, another metaphor. Then we've got more intertextual references. She's very heavy on her references to other texts, and here we've got amongst them was Winston Churchill, who wrote a book about it, and we still call, and we still call one of the pigs Churchill's picket, even though he was not very complimentary about our people. Then to the right hand page, we often picnic among rock carvings of a smiling fat Buddha sitting cross-legged on a lotus flower. And again for Malala, Buddhas kind of represent culture and sort of the old ways, tradition, that sort of thing. And obviously the Taliban will destroy 
some of these Buddhas which she sees as a massive abomination. Uh, then we've got love and support here. So I'm going to be using pink. Um, my father wrote a poem, The Relics of Bukhtara. And it goes as such, when the voice of truth rises from the minarets, the Buddha smiles and the broken chain of history reconnects. So it's very clear where she's got her ideas about uh, the Buddha and his place within her culture and her society from her father. So as such, her thoughts are expressing basically his. And then just some description of the Swat Valley, which is almost characterized as a character itself, the way the amount of detail she goes into. So stuff like our valley is full of fruit trees on which grow the sweetest figs and pomegranates and peaches, that sort of thing. Then over here, we've got a uh, reference to Tape or Tapi, two line poems, which is both an intertextual reference because she's talking to the actual form and also the actual Pashto culture which created this form or at least adopted it extensively, I guess. And then we knew what it was like to be hungry, so my mother always cooked extra and gave food to poor families. So I'm annotating that for activism because it's kind of a very subtle and simple form of activism, just help, helping out charity, that sort of thing. Uh, and obviously, if you grew up in a family that did that, you would kind of have a similar understanding of the world as well. Don't kill doves in the garden. You kill one and the others won't come. So that's a nice little example of tapi or tapi. And also a little intertextual reference as well. Then we've just got a little simile down here. Long icicles hanging from the roof like daggers. Which is just describing a little bit beautifully the Swat Valley. Brother Kushal. Uh, he doesn't get mentioned much. So sort of when he does you might want to make note of it. And he was named Kushul like my father's school after the Pashtun hero. Kushul Khan Katak. A warrior who was also a poet. So again, everything's literary, everything's an intertextual reference here. Then a little simile, like a reed that could snap in the wind there. Then his brother, a tall, bright-eyed and inquisitive like a squirrel, also a simile and characterization of brother. Three children is a small family by Swati standards where most people have seven or eight. So again, Pashtun culture. And she's always setting this up and then obviously later on she'll juxtapose the differences between where she ends up in England. So a metaphor, my father adored her as if she were a fragile china vase, never laying a handle on her, a hand on her, unlike many of our men. So I'm going to do that for gender roles as well. But it's also a metaphor. So keeping like a china vase. Then we've got a little bit of love and support. Um, they're talking about her skin color. It's like when when one mixes milk with tea. So we're also going to put west, west and east because skin color is inherently something cultural that people value or don't value. Pashto culture again here. Being loved by such a beautiful girl gave him confidence. In our society, marriages are usually arranged by families but this was a love match so again love and support so he's sort of supported by a beautiful woman that loves him and that kind of creates the conditions for Malala's successful and happy childhood I guess then Jansa's Khan Hudra was a gathering place for people to talk politics and my father was often there so they had to get to know each other my mother comes from a family of strong women as well as influential men so we're going to do gender roles again, of course. So she's got a strong mother, though. Um, I guess her mother isn't shown as particularly strong throughout the text, um, but she draws a lot of inf inspiration more so from her father. And then, so we've got characterization of her mum here. Though she cannot read or write, my mother shares everything with her, telling her about his, about his day, the good and the bad. And then most Pashto men never do this, a sharing problem was with women is seen as weak. So that's gender roles as well. Obviously the men have a role in the way women are treated and he's sort of bucking the trend. You could even put activism, I guess, if you really felt that strongly about this one. Uh, people would see us and say, what a sweet family. Uh, my mother is very pious and prays five times a day, though not in the mosque, as that is only for the men. So love and support and gender roles both for this little chunk. 
And then also we've got a little symbol of Islam because that is a religious tradition that she's relaying to us. Uh, then we've got clothing, so we'll draw a little picture of that. And then lastly, something about activism. Uh, don't bother with clothes and jewels. So that's her talking about her own approach to clothing and fashion, I guess. But I love to dance behind closed doors with my friends. So again, you got to think of the small personal choices you make in your life as minor forms of activism. And obviously Malala's activism grows as she grows in confidence and sort of maturity throughout this story. So there's clothing. She talks about her mum's love of clothing and her sort of relative dislike of it, though that changes somewhat as the text goes on. So we've got here, it was a peculiar system called Wesh, under which every five or ten years all the families would swap villages and redistribute the land of the new village among the men so that everyone had the chance to work as well as good as well as bad lands. So we've got justice as a motif. And this is sort of one of the ways that the world is kind of managed there to keep things just and even. Then we've got justice again. So they decided to try and find an impartial man to rule the whole area and resolve their disputes. So obviously one of the core issues in the area is solving justice. We've got just a symbol of illiteracy and that's kind of for Malala something that's absolutely horrific and kind of unacceptable. And so for her that kind of runs counter to her activist movement and her beliefs. So. In last page, gender roles, we'd be expected to cook and serve our brothers and fathers, so cultural expectations as well as gender expectations. Then there's a really key quote, Malala will be free as a bird, which is a metaphor or a simile, whatever. Um, and that's really important. You could put basically everything there. It's activism, it's gender roles. It's all sorts of things all together, really. Love and support, it's everything except for probably corruption, I would say but definitely gives you a strong basis to use this in an essay because it's kind of referencing a lot of different things there. Then we've got uh, the top of Mount Elum, like Alexander the Great to touch Jupiter and even beyond the valley, which is an intertextual reference. So we'll sketch in a little book there. But as I watched my brothers running across the roof, flying their kites and skillfully flicking the strings back and forth to cut each other's down, which has got here allusion to the kite runner. That's probably giving the authors more credit than perhaps they deserve, but um, the only text I can think of from in my experience that directly references sort of kites and cutting kite strings is the kite runner. So it's the end of chapter one.